charged with war crimes, but 15 at the time of his arrest. The trial of Omar Kader is getting underway in Guantanamo, and the issue of the legal rights for children is propelled into the spotlight once more. What are the rights of a child in the courts of the world, and are children being failed by the international community? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. Today we're focusing on the rights of the child and the legal systems of the world and how much international courts do to protect minors in the 21st century. Omar Kader is the Canadian national being tried in Guantanamo Bay. The charges against him, war crimes for allegedly throwing a grenade at a US soldier. But Kader was captured by the US Army at the age of 15 in Afghanistan. The perfect example, perhaps, of a child soldier, you may have thought. International law requires child soldiers to be treated as victims of an environment beyond their control, not as adults making a choice to participate in a war. So why is Kader being tried for offences he is supposedly too young to be responsible for? We'll take that issue on and many others besides. And joining us to take them on in London are Professor Carolyn Hamilton, who's director of the Children's Legal Centre at Essex University, Wayne Blyer, programmes director of the NGO War Child, and Christine McCormick, an advisor on child protection in fragile states at Save the Children. All three of you, welcome very much to the programme. I'd like to start with Christine McCormick, if I could, first of all. Uh, Christine, before we get into specifics, a, a general view, if you would. Are, are children being failed by the law around the world, do you think? And if so, to what degree? Um, it's an interesting question. I think. Um, Rather than saying children are being failed, uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, governments, um, both in countries that are affected by conflict and, and other countries, um, and the international community, the humanitarian community, have a much clearer understanding of, of children's rights within uh, armed conflict. And through that, we can ensure that children are being uh, protected um, and their legal rights are being assured. So, so Wayne Blair, it's the case that the, the kind of the legal framework, if you like, it is there, but it's, it's just not being implemented in the way that it should be in, in many, many countries around the world. Yeah, I'd say that was uh, that was fair. I think there's been, like Christine said, a number of of innovations lately, such as Security Council Resolution 1612, which actually allows monitoring and reporting for six grave rights violations against children, but no, and also has sanctions. But sanctions have never been used yet, so there's certainly a lot of more room for implementation of international standards. The thing is, international standards seem to vary, don't they, Professor Hamilton? Uh, I was intrigued to see in our research for this program how things vary from country to country, even state to state in the United States. If you take Pennsylvania, for example, there's no lower limit for the age someone can be charged as an adult with homicide. There are all these discrepancies. Well, that's true. But if you look at international standards, I think the really important thing is that recruitment of children under the age of 15 is now a war crime under the ICC statute. And that's a big change. That's a big move forward. And while the Geneva Conventions and the Convention on the Rights of the Child put the age uh, where children cannot be recruited at 15, if you're under 15, it's an absolute prohibition on recruitment. That's now moved up to 18 in the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that came into force 2002 and we now have 134 countries who've ratified that convention and another 34 who've signed it so we're beginning to see a change in attitude so that child soldiers under 15 it's absolutely recognized okay. that's prohibited but a move all right i just want to jump in there professor I, because it's interesting is that you have all these these discrepancies don't you these disparities as in the case of omar Kado, who we've been talking about uh, he's been tried as an adult in guantanamo but yet he was arrested when he was 15 years old yes but he's not being charged or tried under international law he's being charged and tried in an american court uh, and therefore he's being tried as an adult, and that's to do with American jurisdiction rather than to do with international standards. Okay, and so in that case, Christine McCormack, if he was being tried under international law, I'm right in saying that uh, he would be regarded as a child soldier and therefore would be treated as a victim and not an offender. Is that right? 
That is correct. Okay, yes. and so and so, in what? How can we read that and, and read into what's being uh, done in the United States in Guantanamo Bay? I can't comment myself on, on the situation of, of this trial. I'm, I'm not in a position to do so, but, but Caroline is, is the best um, to comment, I think. Okay, well, look, Caroline, let me just put that to you then. The, this argument that, um, yeah. you know, under international law, he would be a child soldier uh, and he would be uh, not uh, treated as an offender as such, but as a victim. Well, it's a very gray area because he was 15 when he was arrested. And at the time, which is now eight years ago, 2002, the age at which there was a cutoff for a child to be regarded as a child soldier was really 15 years of age. That's why I say now attitudes are different. Now the age is largely regarded as being 18. But at the time, it was 15. Now he should be treated as a child, as a juvenile, because he's aged. 15 at the time he committed the offence, but he's being treated as an adult and being tried in an adult court, and that would generally be regarded as contrary to international standards. Okay, the thing is, you have this uh, this dichotomy, really, don't you? There, uh, you have a supposed child soldier charged with an offence, but meanwhile, over in the Hague, uh, you have people like Charles Taylor and Thomas LeBanga being charged uh, with using and instructing child soldiers. That is to say, it's the general in court and not the uh, child recruit. Wayne Blyer, what do you think about that? Well, I think what you're saying is true. They are, it is, as Carolyn said, a violation of international law now to recruit child soldiers. And I think that's what I can say. Okay, so... Uh, can I add one more thing there? Can I just add one more thing, which is the, the real issue with Omar is that he has been held in administrative detention without charge until 2007. From 2002 to 2007, a period of five years. Now that is totally contrary to international law. Whether he's an adult or whether he's a child, but even more so when he's a child. And that's a very, very grave breach for all children who were held in Guantanamo Bay, all children under the age of 18. Okay, for a long time now, a month-long human rights watch research mission has found some pretty devastating evidence of revealing the extent of child abductions committed by the Lord's Resistance Army over in Uganda. Of the 45 children interviewed by Human Rights Watch, most had been forced to kill other children. Some as young as 10 were abducted in Congo, the Central African Republic and Southern Sudan and armed. These children go on to become the most mm -hmm. vicious sometimes of soldiers and are often ordered to carry out killings. The LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, also uses young girls who have been abducted for sex or as servants. Uh, refusal to participate in sexual relations often results in death. Um, Christine McCormack, children as young as 10 or 11 forced to kill other children. Tell us a little bit more about this, this terrible business. Um, well, I think it's, it's good to recognise that children that age, as young as 10, if not uh, perhaps a wee bit younger, um, have often, in, not only um, in areas affected by the LRA, but in other countries, have been recruited, have been abducted by, by armed groups. And, and very sadly, they are forced to commit crimes. And I think this is uh, a useful point to, to make, that um, it is forced recruitment, it is forced behaviour, um, often to um, to help cut ties that they may have with their families, with their communities, um, and thus making the reintegration process, if and when they are able to be released or come out of those groups, all the more difficult. Um, it is particularly heartbreaking for, for children that age, but it's, it's applicable for, for children and in youth up to sort of 18 so who would be recruited and have the same experiences. Indeed, and children clearly deeply traumatised by what they do. Exactly, yes. And this um, trauma, um, or in whatever form it, it takes, it may be very noticeable, it may, may not be, um, but it is very long-lasting um, and can and, and may lead uh, or last into adulthood and very clearly affect how their adulthood um, progresses.
All right, so when Blair, I, I, yeah, as we've discussed, there, there is a, a framework in mm -hmm. place to try and prevent this kind of thing happening. It's not working, certainly, in these areas. So what kind of comprehensive strategy would you suggest uh, needs to be implemented to try and change things and get things on the right side? Well, certainly we have to get rid of the impunity for these people. We only have, as Carolyn said, two people in the International Criminal Court for recruiting child soldiers, and Charles Taylor is there for other reasons as well. So there's a lot more of those people around, and we also need more sanctions if we are to stop, you know, use 1612, Security Resolution 1612, to affect this problem. Yeah, of course, 1612 uh, mandates a monitoring and reporting mechanism, doesn't it, to yes. monitor and report armed groups yeah. and uh, armed forces using children. But uh, yeah, the bottom yes. line is it's just not working, is it? Because people just don't implement it, do they? No, I wouldn't say it's not working. I'd say that it's, it's, it's a beginning. There are decreases in the overall number of child soldiers, and especially in formal armed groups. The problem is, is that we have a lot of non-formal armed groups, rebel armed groups that don't adhere to international conventions. So, Professor Hamilton, uh, not all countries, as we've been seeing, uphold the principles, apart from the ones we've been talking about. Which other ones are, are guilty of, of crossing the line? Well, certainly non-armed forces in Nepal uh, had a very poor record of recruiting young child soldiers to come into armed forces and also Cambodia, um, obviously Sierra Leone was a huge example of appalling practices in using child soldiers. There has been a reduction overall in the use of child soldiers, but we've been talking about abduction as one side of the problem. But we've also got children who are recruited in, not forcibly taken, but recruitably, re recruited into armed forces. And that's very often an issue of poverty, that children know that they'll be able to eat, they'll get clothing, they'll get shelter if they're in the armed forces and have no other means of supporting themselves. I think that's an issue that also needs to be addressed. We need investments in young people in areas of conflict to make joining armed forces a very much less attractive proposition. So, so you're entering other realms of uh, international policy there, aren't you? Yes, I suppose so. But these are problems of child soldiers. The forcible abduction is only just one part. And we all know that keeping children in education, keeping children in their communities in times of conflict really benefits them enormously and reduces recruitment, voluntary enlistment in armed forces and armed groups. Because as Christy McCormack says, it's incredibly damaging for children to be part of armed groups and armed forces at a young age. It's likely to impact on them for the rest of their lives. And for the girls, it's particularly traumatic. Yeah, Christy McCormack? Yes, I would um, completely agree with that and, and reiterate the importance of the links with communities. Um, uh, the, the difficult or the, the issue of poverty um, that can lead to voluntary recruitment or association is, is well known. Um, but it's also very well recognised um, that weaknesses within communities, um, which is often which often happens when um, security is, is poor and where um, communities and countries are um, vulnerable to sporadic and, and repeated armed conflict. Um, that is another significant um, issue that um, humanitarian agencies and the international um, community it's, itself must must look at and, and very seriously as well because unless these issues are addressed and in a sustainable way um, association of children with armed groups and armed forces whether it's through voluntary recruitment um, forced recruitment abduction um, as well as the other um, grave violations against children that Wayne has spoken about they will continue and, and we may be having this conversation again, you know, in several years' time, talking about exactly the same issues. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? We almost certainly will be having that conversation in several years' time. I, as you say, addressing the issues is the important thing. But uh, Wayne Blyer, getting those issues addressed is a completely different thing. It's easy to say the former. It's much harder to do the latter. 
No, I, I agree 100% with both Christine and Caroline. Our programs, you know, do try to address some of the root causes that lead children to join armed groups or be forced into armed groups. And certainly, you know, it's no accident that the majority of conflicts are in fragile states and the majority of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. So I don't think, you know, it, one has to make too far a stretch to see that there is a connection there. And certainly, you know, we hope by doing what we're doing that we're in, in way preventing that as well as, you know, dealing with the mitigation of the effects of armed conflict. It is, it is an awful emotive subject, isn't it? Uh, Professor Hamilton, from your perspective, a very personal perspective, maybe, I mean, you know the subject very well, you've been studying it and teaching it for a long time, I dare say. Uh, how do you feel about it and uh, how much hope do you have that things may change in the future? I do have some hope. I, I think what Wayne said about having no impunity for those who recruit and use child soldiers is really important. And I think it is very encouraging to see even if only a very few people being charged with the war crime of recruiting children is a big, big step forward. I also think putting political pressure on armed groups through communities, through communities knowing that recruitment and use of child soldiers is wrong, does very slowly move the situation forward. It does lessen the level of recruitment. Okay, let's uh, switch continents now. You mentioned Professor Hamilton a little while ago, uh, Cambodia. Uh, we'll go to Asia now, where in some countries, for some offences, children are treated as the same as adults under the law. And in Cambodia, according to Children's Rights International, once children are arrested and detained by the police, they're typically punished in some extrajudicial way if the offence is minor. If a child is prosecuted and enters the court system or is about to be prosecuted, the, the lack of a, a separate juvenile justice system condemns a child to be tried in adult courts under adult laws. Although they have rights under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, they can still be tried in an adult court and if sentenced to prison the child will be incarcerated alongside adult inmates. Uh, Christine McCormack, to what degree do you think this is the norm in Asian countries specifically? Uh, I, I can't talk about any specific countries, but it's, it's an issue um, that you see in Asia and, and in other locations. Um, and uh, all I can speak about is the effects uh, on those children of being within adult um, judicial processes, adult um, prisons. Um, there are processes that they won't understand. Um, they are at particular risk of physical, emotional, um, sexual abuse and exploitation. Um, and they have no um, assistance, someone to, to explain what, what is happening, someone who is mindful of their conditions and um, ensuring that they come to, to further further harm um, and it is left to a, a small number of, of agencies um, and other bodies, um, some national, some international, who can monitor and, and raise the issue to, to, to this level and, and, and inform people like yourselves. Well, it seems to be pretty imperative, doesn't it, that uh, separate juvenile justice systems are brought into play uh, in countries like Cambodia. Professor Hamilton? It's very important that all countries have proper juvenile justice systems that fully implement what we call the due process guarantees contained in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, there's little point in trying a child who doesn't understand the nature of the trial. It's not a fair trial. Uh, we don't want children detained for long periods of time, either pre-trial or post-trial. Many children can spend months, if not years, before they get to a trial being held in a pretrial detention center, often with adults. And that's deeply undesirable for children. Mm -hmm. Wayne Blair? Yeah, I would say that we have a program dealing with the juvenile justice in Afghanistan, in Herat, and we, w we have been able, with the help of a lot of different actors, to separate children from adults in the jail, having their own juvenile detention facility, have access to legal counsel, have access to health care, and have access to education, and also to visit their, have their families visit them, and also follow them when they return. So, you know, there is some hope. A lot more needs to needs to be done, especially for girls in 
the juvenile justice system because, for example, in Afghanistan, many girls are there because of honor crimes or f for running away from a forced or abusive marriage, and they can't go home. So it's even larger than just the juvenile justice system. It's what happens to these children afterwards as well that's important. And I guess it's also a question of education in the countries themselves, isn't it? Um, yes, it's ed education not um, mainly um, for um, rights bearers. So th the security forces, the, the legal system, the, um, the police um, system, and, and Save the Children in several countries and, and another, other organizations as well, uh, much of our work within juvenile justice is training and educating these um, authorities in child rights. Um, according to to international law and often what is actually actually has been agreed to at a national level um, so there's training there is advocacy work that we would do with authorities and with governments to ensure that what they have agreed to and what legally they are obliged to do actually filters down to community levels um, and that legal systems they do work and they do work for children that children have support um, if they are at conflict, in conflict with the law, and that there is suitable and appropriate care for them and support for them as they go through that system. So, Professor Hamilton, uh, finally, uh, systems do work, legal systems are in place, they do work for, for children in certain countries, but overall, there's still a great deal of work to do. I think that's for sure both in the realm of juvenile justice and children who are involved in armed conflict, are still a very long way to go. OK, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much indeed for your time. A very interesting discussion. Thank uh, you. Professor Hamilton, Carolyn Hamilton, uh, Wayne Blyer and Christine McCormack, thanks very much indeed. And thank you for watching you. this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Just email them to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net from me, Nick Clark. It's goodbye for now.